Over on Jaguar Gator 8, a new college football video is out. In this video, we talk about Florida State during the 1988 season and how they dropped in the AP ranking simply because a voter forgot to put them on his ballot. Click the card at the upper right corner to watch. And now, on with our feature presentation. What is the purpose of a test? Well, there's two purposes to any test. The first is to see whether or not you can or cannot do something. As an example, in school, can you show that you're proficient in this scientific concept? If you're on a team and you have a conditioning test, can you make it through in the necessary time and show a stamina and quickness level that is appropriate for a game? The second is the application of the test, because any good and practical test has consequences and rewards. In school, this comes in the form of a grade. You do well on the test, and you get an A. But you do poorly, and you get an F and your grade goes down. In sports, this comes in the form of playing time and a spot on the roster. It might even come in the form of a fine or a monetary punishment. If you're going to have a test, you need something that you're trying to accomplish, and you need a punishment if you don't do well. Apparently, Denver Broncos head coach Dan Reeves did not get the memo on this whatsoever. Because in 1983, the team issued a drug test to one of their players. And as it turns out, the drug test was completely meaningless. It meant absolutely nothing. Imagine if you're a prospective lawyer and you take the bar. And afterwards, it's revealed that whether or not you actually pass the bar does not matter. Because just for taking the bar, you're automatically a lawyer, thereby defeating the entire purpose of having the bar in the first place. Well, as stupid as that sounds, that's kind of what happened here with the handling of wide receiver Rick Upchurch. And this is the story behind the stupidest drug test in the over 60 year history of the Denver Broncos. And quite possibly, the stupidest drug test in the history of the entire NFL. Before I talk about the actual drug test in question, we need some context to understand just who Rick Upchurch is, how good of a player he was, and why he was being drug tested in the first place. When people talk about the greatest players in the history of the Broncos franchise, if they're talking about the period between the second half of the 1970s and the first half of the 1980s, odds are, the first name that comes to mind is Upchurch. He had one of the greatest debuts in NFL history, when in week one of the 1975 season against the Kansas City Chiefs, in a 37-33 victory, he had 153 receiving yards, a receiving touchdown, and a rushing touchdown. And while some great debuts are just flukes, that was not the case for Upchurch because that incredible start to his career against the Chiefs was a sign of things to come. From 1975 to 82, Upchurch was a true dual threat. Yes, he was a pretty solid receiver, as from 1975 to 82, he had 227 receptions for 3,730 yards and 22 touchdowns, even finishing inside the top 10 in the entire NFL in 1979 when he had 64 receptions. And yes, he made a great impact on offense, including that 1979 campaign where he led the team in receptions and receiving touchdowns, and in 1980, when he finished second on the team in both of those categories. But the real way that he made his mark was on special teams, as you could not find a more electric return man in the sport than Upchurch. Putting the ball to Upchurch was just asking for trouble. From 1976 to 82, he had eight punt return touchdowns, and was named a first-team All-Pro three times because of it. In 1976, he had four punt return touchdowns, which, even though it has since been tied by Devin Hester in 2007 with the Chicago Bears and Patrick Peterson in 2011 with the Arizona Cardinals, has not been broken, as he still has the best season by any punt returner ever from a touchdown standpoint. He led the league in yards per punt return three times, including in 1982, when he averaged an astonishing 16.1 yards per return becoming just the second player in the Super Bowl era at the time, alongside Lamar Parrish back in 1974 for the Cincinnati Bengals, to accomplish this feat. And in 1976, in a 44-13 victory over the Cleveland Browns, he made NFL history by recording two punt returns for a touchdown in the same game. Not only did this tie an NFL record, and not only did it make him the first Bronco to ever do this, but it made him the first player to do this in an NFL game in a quarter century when Jack Christensen did this with the Detroit Lions all the way back in 1951, nearly a decade before the Broncos even became a team. 
Safe to say, Up Church was great, and there's a reason that he's a member of the All 1970s first team and the All 1980s second team. He was the best punt returner of his era, and there's probably not even a close second. However, as great as his career was going, things seemed like they were taking a bit of a nosedive heading into the 1983 season. Don't get me wrong, Up Church was still playing at a high level and was showing no signs of slowing down. In 1982, he returned two punts for a touchdown in the strike shortened season, and was named a Pro Bowler and a first team All Pro. On the field, it seemed like nothing could stop him. But off the field, he made some rather troubling remarks, or at least that's what the papers say. During the offseason, Upchurch went to a 28 day drug rehabilitation program in Minnesota. He was recommended by the NFL to do this, because he was having some issues with drugs. He did cocaine, although he hadn't done it since 1979 saying that it wasn't his drug of choice, but primarily, he did marijuana. As Upchurch said, Marijuana was something I enjoyed. I smoked marijuana after the games. I've smoked it socially too with personal friends. I didn't think it was a problem because it didn't affect my play. Upon completing rehab, the Broncos and head coach Dan Reeves said that they were willing to help him out, that Upchurch would be on the team as long as he stayed clean, and Upchurch said that he was clean, saying that he was as clean as a hound's tooth. The troubling part was what Upchurch allegedly said afterwards. Now, the newspaper said that Upchurch said, I'm not saying I haven't or won't touch any more of it. As long as I don't do it on the football field or in public or distribute it, I think it's all right. When I retire, maybe if I have a desire to. Which doesn't exactly sound like a quote from a guy who's fully clean. Upchurch denied ever making those statements, saying that he was misquoted, that he didn't condone marijuana use, and said that the quote didn't paint the full picture. Whose side you choose to believe on this one is up to you. But this was not the last controversy involving Upchurch with marijuana. Far from it, in fact. Because four months later, Upchurch was about to get himself into some more trouble. And the fallout from that was ridiculously stupid. Through the first 10 games of the 1983 season, Upchurch was actually playing pretty well. He was no longer the team's punt returner, despite that incredible 1982 season of his as Zach Thomas, the undrafted rookie out of South Carolina State, assumed the position. But he was playing well at receiver and contributing on offense, recording 33 receptions for 533 yards. He had already surpassed his reception total from 1982, and even if he didn't play another snap, his 33 receptions was the third most he'd ever had in a season throughout his nine-year career. And he was on pace for 52 receptions for 852 yards with both of those totals only being behind his 1979 season for the best numbers ever. Through 10 games, the Broncos, after being 2-7 the year before and being one of the worst teams in all of football, were 6-4 and four, and were shocking a ton of people by being right in the playoff picture, with the incredible play of the 31-year-old Rick Upchurch being a big reason why. And his great play being vital to the team's success was not an understatement. In their most recent win, a 27-24 victory over the Kansas City Chiefs, Upchurch had a team-high six receptions for a game-high 143 yards, and what was, from a receiving yard standpoint, the second-best game of his career, only behind that 1975 debut of his. And coming up next for the Broncos was an absolutely critical game against the Los Angeles Raiders on the road. This game was big for a variety of reasons. Number one, the Broncos were looking for revenge, and to avoid getting swept by their AFC West rival after the Raiders came into Mile High in Week 4 and embarrassed them 22-7. But number two, this game had huge implications for the Broncos in both the division and the wildcard hunt. From the division perspective, the Broncos were 6-4, and, and the Raiders, who were leading the division, were 7-3. and three. Win this game, and you're tied for the division lead with five games to go. Lose this game, and your odds of winning the division are slim to none as not only are you two games back, but the Raiders own the head-to-head -head tiebreaker, making it more like three back with five to go. And from the wildcard perspective, there were four teams in the AFC tied at six and four and vying for two spots, with the Broncos tied with the Bills, Colts, and Seahawks. And that's not even counting the two teams at five and five and the Patriots and the Browns, who still had a realistic shot at pulling off an overtake. Going on the road to beat the Raiders was going to be Denver's toughest outing of the season, but it was one that a lot of Broncos fans felt that they needed to win for those aforementioned reasons. And if they were going to win, 
then they were going to need Rick Upchurch to ball out once again, as he had done for most of the season. However, as part of his condition for playing with the team in 1983, Upchurch had to stay clean and had to take weekly drug tests. If he failed the test, he was gone. As Reeves said back in July, as long as he continues to make progress and show that he is rehabilitated, we'll stick with him. And sure enough, when he took a test in the week leading up to the game, he tested positive. Just like that, Upchurch violated the team's drug policy, violated the agreement he made with his head coach and the team, and was potentially going to be in hot water with the NFL as well, especially with the NFL starting to crack down on things like this as the war on drugs ramped up, and as the league was put in a negative light through exposés and stories like the one done by PBS Frontline earlier that year. So Upchurch took the drug test for marijuana and tested positive. What did the Broncos decide to do about this? They decided that they were going to lay the hammer on him and decided that they were going to punish him by doing absolutely nothing. Seriously, they did nothing. Upchurch apologized to the team and that was enough. Reeves let him play in the game as though everything was business as usual. No suspension, no fine, no releasing from the team. How does that make any sense? Do you realize how stupid that is? Why would you have Upchurch take a drug test if the results of the test mean absolutely nothing? Number one, it just seems like a giant waste of time, energy, and money to issue a test that means nothing at the end of the day. Number two, it completely undermines your credibility and sets an absolutely horrible precedent. So if I'm a player and I want to smoke, but I'm not allowed to per team policy, what's stopping me from doing that now that I know that Rick Upchurch could do it and get off scot-free? If I have to do a conditioning test in order to make the roster, what's the point in me trying to go all out for the test if I now know that the head coach can just throw those results out the window. You've created an ultimate double standard if you punish a player for failing a test when you didn't do that for Upchurch, especially after he basically lied to you and the media about how clean he really was. Think of why anyone would take a drug test seriously for you if you're willing to throw the results out for no reason. And no one on the team commented about this. Reeves didn't address the media, Upchurch didn't address the media, and no one in the front office addressed the media, with the team staying radio silent. If you're going to make a decision that goes against everything that you said you stood up for, at the very least, be willing to face the music. The fact that you said back in July that Upchurch had to stay clean for him to stay on the team, and now he wasn't clean, and not only are you keeping him on the team, but you're not even punishing him in any capacity? You had no problem telling the media the first part, but the moment you were forced to actually act on that, you acted in cowardice. And no, I'm not saying that Upchurch should have been cut, suspended, or fined for failing a drug test issued by the team for marijuana. That is not the point of this at all. That is not at all what I'm trying to get across. My point is that you have to be consistent with your stance. And if you change your mind, then you better be willing to defend it. And Dan Reeves did not do that here. Why are you issuing a drug test if you're not going to actually use the results of the drug test. Going back to that lawyer example I mentioned at the top of the video, why are you issuing the bar if you're not going to actually use the results of the bar and you're going to let everyone in regardless of what they scored? It's flat out insulting to everyone involved. And the fact that the Broncos did this and the NFL allowed them to get away with this is mind boggling on so many levels. The Broncos wound up losing the game 22 to 20 in what turned out to be a great game with Raider kicker Chris Barr hitting the game-winning 39-yard field goal with four seconds left. And Upchurch, who got to play in this game for reasons that four decades later, I still don't know, played well, recording three receptions for 63 yards. He led the Broncos in both receptions and receiving yards, so he was the team's best receiver yet again, even if no one knew why he was on the field in the first place. Unfortunately for Upchurch, he never played again after that 1983 season. He suffered a neck injury, that kept him out for just about the rest of the season. And that was the end of that. And don't get me wrong, Upchurch had a fantastic career in the NFL, to the point where not many people even remember this incident, and to the point where he was inducted into the Denver Broncos Ring of Fame, where he is just one of 34 people in franchise history to receive this prestigious honor. Having said that, the way his career ended was nothing short of bizarre, with the most meaningless drug test of all time. So what's the moral of the story? Don't issue tests that have no purpose. 
and don't waste people's time and create trust issues by doing something like this. If you're going to do a drug test, then there should be a punishment for failing the test. Otherwise, there is literally no point in issuing the drug test. Because in 1983, this debacle of a drug test for Wickup Church left a lot of people up in arms. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar 9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.